Okay, um, this is the third in a three-part lecture to give um, Skyline High School students a very, very, very brief overview of um, World War II. Um, and this part is going to take us from um, Operation Overlord in June of 44 to the fall of Berlin in May of 1945. And if you look at the map, and we begin in each one of these with a series of map or a map like this, um, this one's a lot more comforting. Um, as you can see, a lot more is turned red, which is belongs to the Allies. Um, Nazi Germany in blue is being overrun and attacked from almost every possible direction um, by the spring of 1945, and the Germans are completely and totally on the run. And that's what this lecture is going to take us through is the fall of Nazi Germany. Um, to begin with, um, we need to start with Operation Overlord. And Operation Overlord is something that you may or may not have heard of as D-Day before. And by the way, just to answer the question now, D-Day means absolutely nothing and they have no idea why it was named that. It just got that name. Um, but it's something you may or may not have heard of as D-Day. And what it actually is is the planning and all the things around that, um, along with the um, invasion of northern France and then like move on to eventually take Paris and stuff after that. Um, and uh, as I said in the lecture on the uh, on the first um, and like the very first lecture, I said, you know, when Germany wanted to take France, France was the big prize for a number of reasons, going back a millennia, but also based in and around the events of World War Two, and so, or sorry, World War One, and so it's no um, surprise at all that um, the Allies' reconquest of France is also the big prize. This goes back a millennia, and it was also based in and around the events of World War One, and that's really what the Allies had wanted to do. It's what Roosevelt had wanted to do from the beginning. Um, a series of deals puts Dwight Eisenhower as supreme commander of the Allied forces. And once his um, troops have finished landing in Operation Torch in North Africa, he leaves and goes to Britain to start planning Operation Overlord. Um, that's that's or the invasion of France, which will eventually be known as Operation Overlord. Um, the thing about this is that every single person knows this is coming. It's just a matter of how, when, and where. Okay, everybody knows it's coming. Conventional wisdom says that this attack is going to come at Calais, which is like the shortest crossing point between Dover and Calais historically between England and France. And Hitler's completely and totally in belief about that, and the Allies are going to exploit that like crazy. Um, it's actually not. It's going to come at Normandy if you miss that. Um, but... To this end, they're going to institute something called Operation Fortitude, um, and you can see that on the right. Um, they're no, they're not actually lifting tanks. Um, I asked my four-year-old how they'd be able to do this, and he said they were really strong. And I was like, no, 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 Covey, they're not really strong. These are actually inflatable tanks, um, and that's exactly what it is. Operation Fortitude was this massive decoy with inflatable tanks, fake uh, inflatable tanks fake planes, all sorts of things like that. They even got Patton, who'd gotten in trouble for that slapping incident we talked about last time. They got Patton to come up there and pretend to um, command it. He was none too happy about that, but he was in trouble, so he had to. Um, and so every time the Germans um, spy planes flew over, they thought that like there was another army built up over here ready to attack here. Um, and the end result is that um, Hitler's not going to listen to his generals, and this will come into play hardcore. So like the decoy and stuff, and you had Fortitude North, Fortitude South, you had all sorts of fakes. You had fake messages that they let the Nazis intercept and decode, stuff like that. Um, the real invasion plan for Normandy is planned for early June, okay, and it's supposed to start um, uh, a couple days earlier, and then there's some bad weather, and so finally in the early morning of June um, 6, 1944, um, D-Day begins. Yep, there you go, I'm going to say it again. June 6, 1944, D-Day. This is the Allied invasion of Normandy beaches. This is one of um, about 11 dates you have to memorize in all of this European history class. Coincidentally, two of those 11 dates are on um, this PowerPoint itself. Um, but this is uh, one of them right here, June 6, 1944, 6644. And that is one of the more iconic photos taken. You'll see a couple um, very iconic photos in this thing um, of the... Uh, of the um, landing at the beaches in D-Day at that time. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the landings. The Allies um, had divided uh, the beaches. They divided their forces into five um, parts, two American groups, two British groups, and a Canadian group, okay? And that's where we're going to land. And all of those actually are really instrumental. And as much as I even like to make fun of the Canadians, um, what they did at Juneau was, uh, was fairly important um, in order to, uh, to make the rendezvous points and stuff like that work. Okay, and around 5 that morning, they're going to land on these beaches. Um, Utah and Omaha to the Americans, gold and sword to the Brits, and Juno to the Canadians. Um, the generals told people to expect around casualties of, of, of around 50% in the first wave, and that is astronomically high. Okay, casualties of 10% is considered very, very high, so 50% is, is just absolutely through the roof here. 
Um, basically, each beach, um, and you can see a picture of what the beaches look today down on the bottom left, and then what they looked like when they had the Nazi anti-tank fortifications and stuff like that there on the right. Um, basically, each beach um, needed to be taken, and each um, person, or each, like, um, beginning of the beach needed to be taken by the Marines, and then they needed to clear the top part so that you could get all the German snipers and stuff like that out, so that then you could get tanks and stuff like that onto the beach to be able to liberate France, okay? Um, each one had a specific objective and position that you don't need to know and stuff like that. Um, what is important to know is that um, at first it's not going very well. This thing starts at 5 o'clock and like uh, actually the, the Brits are the most successful. Eventually the Americans will be on Omaha and Utah, but things go very, very badly at Utah Beach to start with. Um, and a number of like uh, checkpoints where like, you know, there were supposed to be like bombs here and there weren't and stuff like that or miss and blah, blah, blah. One thing that really does help the Allies, though, is the decoys, okay? That and the fact that a drugged-up Hitler actually sleeps through the vast majority of this. At one time, Rundstedt is like, hey, I need tanks, and Hitler's actually asleep, and since Hitler's taken supreme control of the forces in an idiotic way, um, Hitler can't give him his tanks. Um, but also, because of the decoys, people like Rommel and Manstein and Rundstedt and people like that are sitting there saying, like, Hitler, we need more things, and Hitler leaves a large force over in Calais. Um, and so, as a result, by evening, the Allies are successfully able to take the beaches in what is one of the largest and most successful gambles in all of military history. Um, the picture you're looking at here is actually what um, modern-day Normandy looks like. This is right above the beach, and this is the uh, cemeteries of Normandy. I think it's the American cemetery, but I also feel like there are British and Canadian people buried there, too, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't remember. It's absolutely mind-blowingly um, gorgeous and eerie and fascinating. If you ever get the chance, you absolutely should check it out. Um, um, what happens is the uh, the Allies are able to take control of uh, the beaches um, by that night, and um, they're able to kind of free up and finish out Operation Overlord within the first few weeks of like the of the next um, time. This makes Hitler really, really, really unpopular. This is a massive blow. This is the crumbling of fortress for Europe. Um, this is when the German populace begins to admit that the war cannot be won. I'd said earlier that like the Nazi high command and stuff like that admitted the war could not be won. Um, to add on to the psyche of this, um, first you have D-Day on June 6, 1944. Um, then um, you have a uh, assassination attempt and coup plot known as Operation Valkyrie against Hitler on July 20th of 1944. 1944. Um, Rommel was actually tangentially involved in that, so Hitler actually gives Rommel a choice of a trial with execution and humiliation, or he can commit suicide and they can claim it was some type of medical thing and his family will be spared and he'll have state honors, and so Rommel tries to commit suicide, or Rommel not try, Rommel does commit suicide and that's the end of Rommel. Um, so you have first D-Day on that, then you have um, the assassination attempt on July 20th, 1944, and then on August uh, 25th, 1944, um, the Allies liberate Paris. Um, they've gotten into Paris by August 19th, and it only took a few days for the German arm army to give in, and Paris falls. Um, by August of 1944, by the end of that month, uh, month um, Vichy France has been taken apart. Uh, Pétain is actually arrested. He's actually going to be um, convicted of treason and sentenced to death, but he dies in jail before he can actually be shot. Um, and um, the French are now going to rejoin the side of the Allies. Um, they are going to be pretty much led by a dude by the name of Charles de Gaulle, who had been charged of the Free French in the military um, after that. And um, the Allies are going to secure France um, by August or so. And then by um, the fall or so, they're going to turn their attention towards like the liberation of like Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, the Benelux countries. Um, the next operation, which is um, an attempt to free the uh, the Benelux countries, particularly the Netherlands, is actually going to be the only um, uh, defeat that the Allies really have um, from pretty much El Alamein on. Um, and this is known as Operation Market Garden. Um, it's a paratrooper um, thing, and it was the brainchild of General Bernard Montgomery, the uh, the um, head of the uh, British um, forces during this time. And the idea was that they could quickly liberate Europe by dropping a bunch of people behind the lines, meeting up on a few bridges. Okay, that was the drop was Market, and then the meetup was Garden, after Operation Market Garden, meeting up at a few bridges. Um, and kind of bypassing the German line of defense. The Germans had built this line called the Siegfried Line right down their border as kind of like a last line of defense should like the Reich ever start to fall. And this was going to kind of like um, uh, bypass that. And to do that, um, this would be the largest paratrooper dropping in history. And the plan was to start um, a domino of liberation effect that like, you know, would allow the Benelux countries, Scandinavia to fall, um, France had fallen, you know, um, Patton's gone, but Mark Clark and people are still in Italy and stuff like that. They could push up through this way um, 
Bradley, Omar Bradley could take the troops in um, France, uh, kind of like through the middle and like sweep through Belgium in that area, and it would just lead to this domino of kind of liberation or so. Um, the problem is this, is that um, they they short the amount of people they need. In other words, while it's a huge mass of dropping, they, they don't have enough paratrooper droppings as they actually need. Um, and the Germans are able to secure and take the bridges in, in the Netherlands way more than they need. And if you don't know this, the Netherlands is a country that's below sea level, so it's very flat. So like there are lots of canals and bridges and stuff. And if you can't control the bridges, you can't control the country. Um, and the bulk of the fighting is done in and around Arm and Arnhem. Um, where the British meets way more resistance um, than they than they expected from the Germans, and the end result is this thing like kind of fails miserably, and it's brought up and it's important because it's seen by historians as 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 um, as something that really like the Allies didn't fully think through, and if they had fully thought through, they might have realized this might not have worked, but because it didn't work and because people are taken and because it occurs in August right before the winter and stuff like that, um, most historians would argue that this extends the war by about six months, um, which leads to that much more implementation of the Final Solution. Um, which leads to um, that many more like you know deaths etc cetera, etc cetera. and it also leads to um, a massive famine in the Netherlands known as the Dutch hunger winter because the Dutch are not able to be liberated um, between um, by like 44 and so they have to wait until like 1945 or so and so there's kind of mass starvation there so the failures of Operation Market Garden actually um, uh, point out some of the like um, continued problems that the Allies have and that like you know while things are looking good not it's not just a complete and total like you know waltz to Berlin or so at this point, if that makes sense. Um, once they realize that um, that uh, Market Garden is going to be a failure and that they need to liberate the Benelux countries the other way, the Allies are going to try another attack um, in something known as the Ardennes Offensive. Um, Americans know it as the Battle of the Bald, but the rest of the world knows it as the Ardennes Offensive or so. Um, through the Ardennes Forest in southeastern Belgium as a way of kind of pushing the Germans back to the Siegfried Line. Um, and this, by the way, is the the other main counteroffensive that the Germans are able to muster during this time. The Allies are sitting there; they're kind of waiting for like you know the snow to fall and stuff like that. And they actually get a German attack, and this is Hitler Hitler's like last attempt to neutralize the Western Front. In the end, um, the Ardennes offensive by the Germans is not is not. Um, uh, is not um, successful, and the Allies then are able to continue through the Arden Forest, like push the Germans back, continue through the Arden Forest, and then like make their way into liberation of like the Benelux countries and stuff like that. Um, this is also the single bloodiest encounter of the war for Americans, which is why it's kind of famous on American um, from an American point of view. Um, it gets its name because it's basically a series of attacks and counterattacks, as I said, and stuff like that. Um, and what happens is the line um, it it bulges out, kind of like a a pocket if that makes sense but it doesn't fully break um, and yes if that sounds a little dirty we're dealing with a bunch of you know 18 to 21 year old Americans who fought in the battle and then looked at the map and then we're coming up for a funny name for it and thought oh that's kind of funny we'll go with that right um, and and so it creates a bunch of bulges or pockets in the American line um, but they are they never actually collapse so it doesn't break in any way whatsoever um, this thing starts in December of 1944, um, and it begins with the German, with the planned counteroffensive I talked about. And at first, um, the Nazis, um, the Allies get kind of surrounded. They fall into, like, complete pockets of resistance, and the Nazis are in complete and total control. Okay, one of the um, more important um, pockets that um, serves as a really good example for two reasons. One, it's a it's a good historical example. Um, two, um, when I was traveling around the Benelux countries after my bachelor party, I actually randomly found myself um, getting a speeding ticket. Actually, not me, my brother, but I was in the car getting a speeding ticket um, next to the um, memorial to Belgian and American friendship that you see right there on the side of the road. Um, and then after getting that ticket and finally realizing that the speed limit was significantly lower than we thought, um, we went into the nearby town and we're like, wait, what the heck is an American tank doing in this town? Um, and started looking around and then I remember the story of Bastonia and stuff like that. Um, and it actually serves as a, as a really good example of like the various pockets that we're talking about. So one of these pockets or bulges, right, occurred near this Belgian town of Bastonia. Um, and in it, General, um, Anthony McAuliffe, this American general and his troops are outnumbered by the Nazis about three to one. Um. And what McCullough does is he does this kind of domino effect where he has some troops fight over here, some troops fight over here, and then move around and stuff like that. So it looks like to the Nazis that he has significantly more troops than he actually does. Um, and what this represents is kind of the like um, the like place that war has gotten to at this point. That like these sides are going to do pretty much anything they can um, to make sure that they don't surrender. As a matter of fact, very kind of comically, the Nazi. Um, 
General Sims an order asking for McAuliffe's surrender. Um, McAuliffe writes back at the time, just nuts. Nothing other than that. Like, it says, will you surrender? And the response to that is nuts. He doesn't give any verb. He doesn't have a translator. I mean, can you imagine the Nazi high command getting that back? So what was the American's uh, response to surrender? He said, nuts, sir. What the bleep does that mean? I have no idea. As a matter of fact, in his memoirs afterwards, McAuliffe even said himself he had no idea what that meant. He was just frustrated and looking for some quick response. That's what he had him sent back. Um, but McAuliffe is willing to go through things like nuts, hold on the domino, like hold this thing out as long as possible. Um, and eventually, um, the uh, American tanks um, are able to bust through what had been Patton and people like that. Um, are able to like bust through and kind of relieve this thing and this gives you an idea of like what they meant by the kind of bend but not breaking and the kind of like you know the last counter offensive that doesn't quite work for the germans here the other thing that comes out of this though that you should be aware about is something called the malady massacre um and through some type of debatable error or possible direct order from the ss we really have no idea um 90 american paratroopers that surrendered are captured um at a uh, field near belgium and they are just shot um and uh, this actually leads to a U.S. order that um, no um, SS troops or paratroopers are to be taken prisoner from here on out. They are to be shot on sight, um, which leads to, um, because, you know, uh, whether you can justify them or not because of the things the Nazis did, the Allies definitely committed war crimes as well during the course of this war. We'll talk about another one in a second. Um, and one of those is unquestionably the American massacre at Dachau. Um, after liberating the camp, the U.S. kind of lines up all SS people in there and just shoots them um, and then makes the town of Dachau walk through and look at the camp and clean up and see what it's done. I'm not saying I have a personal problem with that or anything like that. That's debatable and something that unfortunately we don't have time to talk about with the essential new learning, but we would have actually discussed in class. Um, but it's, uh, it's this incident in this order that really shows that, hey, things are heating up hardcore. The Allies are even issuing a, like, do not, like, you know, um, take prisoners, like, take no prisoners or shoot them on site order, um, committing war crimes at this point. And this represents the last, the, 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 um, the Ardennes Offensive is the last serious offensive the Nazis are going to make. Um, from here, they are going to basically um, retreat to the border of Germany and to the Siegfried Line. Um, after that retreat, um, the Allies are, are really closing in on, on the Germans from all sides, all around, from the Nazis all around. Um, but there are a couple things we need to talk about, a couple kind of interludes, um, before we get to the actual fall of Berlin. Um, the first is um, a battle that takes place in February of 1945, known as the firebombing of Dresden. Um, now, just to be clear on this, Dresden is a German city on the um, in the eastern part of Germany on the Elbe, known as the Florence of the Elbe. There was this very beautiful city that had some manufacturing, but not a ton, um, not a lot of armaments. It was not a hotbed of Nazi activity like, say, Nuremberg had been or something along those lines or Munich or anything along those lines. Um, and it had been pretty much untouched during the war. Um, that's going to be the Allies' logic for doing this, but, you know, from the other point of view, it's kind of like, hey, you've made it to February of 45 untouched. Why do you need to do this? Um, and the Allies have perfected a, te or to, uh, perfected a technique um, called firebombing that involves um, strategically hitting um, the center of a city with incendiary weapons. And in doing this, you create these huge pillars of fire that burn at like 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, um, that just kind of obliterate the city. Um, and for reasons that, I'll be honest, most historians today see no really good reason for it. They think this is kind of Churchill's revenge for the Blitz and the bombing and stuff like that. Um, for reasons that are unclear, from February 13th to 15th, now, having said that, let me back up, I will say some historians look at this and say, okay, they did have reasons for this. There were, this was like the only population base that hadn't been hit. It was the only place Germans could harbor out, stuff like that. There were some industry stuff like that. There is a minority of historians believe that, but most of them see it as revenge. So for reasons reasons, though, that, as I said, are debatable or unclear, on February 13th to 15th, um, U.S. and U.K. forces, and this is kind of like the, the war crime thing we were talking about a second ago, um, just obliterate um, the city of Dresden, um, dropping hundreds and hundreds of tons of explosives on it. I've forgotten the exact range. Um, they, uh, the um, city, as you can see, is, is just um, completely incinerated. It gets so hot that many things, including bodies, are just flat out liquefied. Um, we have a great primary source account on this because um, Kurt Vonnegut, um, an American author, um, actually lived through the firebombing of Dresden and wrote an award-winning book called Slaughterhouse-Five on it. Um, anyway. Um, things are just kind of completely liquefied, et, et, et cetera, et cetera, on this, and the city is absolutely leveled. Um, and as I said, there's not a fantastically good reason for doing this. Casualties range um, somewhere between 25,000 and 40,000 by most modern historians, though German propaganda tried to put it as high as 250,000. Other people have said as high as 120,000. Those numbers seem a bit inflated. 25 to 40 tends to be the official thing. 
Um, so that's kind of the first kind of interlude before we get to kind of the end of Nazi Germany here. Um, the second one I want to talk about um, briefly are um, two conferences that occur and some things that occur with them here. Um, you see the picture right there. You got Churchill, um, FDR, and Stalin. And these guys eventually become known as the Big Three. Um, and um, at Yalta, um, which is in Crimea, they meet in February of 45, and they make one really, really key agreement, which is they agree that after Germany um, has been defeated, it will be divided up into four zones at the end of the war. Um, the United States, uh, United Kingdom, USSR, and France will each get a zone. And not only are they going to divide up Germany into four zones, they're going to divide Berlin into four zones, too. This will be really important when it comes to, you know, East Germany, West Germany, the Berlin Wall, Cold War, stuff like that, like in the future, Okay. They meet again in July of 1945 after the war has ended. Now, a couple things have happened since then, or at least, sorry, the war in Europe has ended. The war in, uh, in, in Asia is still going on. That's going to last till August of 45. Um, but uh, a couple things have happened since then. One, um, Clement Attlee has replaced Churchill as prime minister. Um, he beat him in an election. Um, Churchill was becoming increasingly unpopular because like, of shortages at home and stuff like that. And Churchill's going to be Attlee in the next election, but for a little bit he's replaced, so Attlee's there. And um, Franklin Roosevelt actually died. Um, he ran for his fourth term. He won, um, but he dies um, 13 years into his presidency. Um, and he is going to be replaced um, by Harry Truman. And so Truman, Attlee, and Stalin meet again in Potsdam, and they agree on two other really key things that supposedly are going to impact how the war is fought and or not how the war is fought um the makeup of the world after the war um one is that free and fair elections will be held in all parts of europe after the war and this really matters in places like oh i don't know poland that the red army is occupying supposedly that's going to happen two is that the ussr will jump in and help in japan after the war um, and Europeans. Neither of these things really happen. You know, free and fair elections are held if in the sense that the only person running is a communist party and you can only vote for them. And the you know, USSR jumps in and helps in Japan if in the sense you include that they do that in August 20th of 1945, well after both atomic bombs have been dropped and Japan's that close to surrendering. So neither of these really happen. Um, this is significant because this usually is marked as the beginning of the Cold War. It's at this um, conference that U.S. President Truman tries to scare Stalin by saying, hey, we've got this big bomb. We might drop it on Japan, blah, blah, blah. Stalin plays dumb, but we now know that he already knew because he had spies that were well aware of that. Um, but most historians see this as kind of the beginning of tensions between the U.S. and the USSR. Time to take down Nazi Germany. This is one of the most iconic photos in the history of the world. The Russian flag or the Soviet flag being planted over the Reichstag. The Soviets are going to get there first, and they are going to completely obliterate Berlin. Um, by the time the spring of 45 hits, the Nazis are screwed. Um, the Red Army is invading from the east with six million troops. Britain, France, and the United States are invading from the West with 3 million-plus troops. I mean, they are just getting completely and totally overrun here, okay? Um, the Red Army, led by Georgi Zhukov, who becomes known as the Conqueror of Berlin, gets there first. This is really important. They're going to forever change history by doing this. They're going to because they'd agreed to divide up Berlin um, into four zones and Germany into four zones, but they didn't say which four. So, like, the Red Army is going to get there, and they're going to take the most important, fashionable parts of Berlin where all the, like, stuff are. Um, that's what that picture is up, up top, the one on the top left that kind of looks just like a parking lot. Yeah, well, that's Hitler's Fuhrer bunker. That's the spot in which Adolf Hitler committed suicide, probably. We don't know for sure. Why? Because the Soviets didn't document it. They just obliterated it, covered up, um, turned it into a parking lot, and um, building stuff like that didn't um, like kind of keep a memorial or anything along those lines. Um, so they get there. Um, they um, take their zone. Zhukov becomes known as the conqueror of Berlin and the most decorated general in Russian history. Um, the Red Army runs wild on Berlin, um, raping, plundering, killing all all of this is revenge for Stalingrad. There is estimated there are approximately a million and a half German casualties. And it's not necessarily like, you know, soldiers, it's women, it's children. On top of that, it's like 12 year olds or 60 year olds that Hitler has conscripted to like, you know, save Berlin because Hitler's sitting there in his bunker, like, you know, a broken man, um, blaming the German people for all of this and saying like, they didn't do enough for me, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you've ever seen the Hitler rants on YouTube, um, if you actually check out the movie Downfall that they come from, it actually does a pretty good job portraying all that. 
um, and stuff along those lines. Um, but Hitler's just, um, you know, completely doing that. And so he's like trying to get like 12 year olds and 60 year olds. So they, those are crushed. Um, about a million and a half um, German casualties um, occur during this time. Um, Hitler commits suicide, shooting himself on the 30th and leaving the Reich to Joseph Goebbels. Um, Goebbels um, commits suicide um, on the 1st, um, but not after first murdering his six children because he, quote, couldn't stand. He has them, um, he has a doctor um, uh, give them morphine and then he crushes a cyanide pill in their mouth because he and his wife couldn't stand to have them raised in a world without the Fuhrer. Um, and then Himmler, who's caught by um, the Brits, um, eventually commits suicide in his, um, in, once he's in captivity. Most Nazis had a tooth that they could pop off in the back that had a pill in it to commit suicide. And once Hitler, Himmler realizes that he's not going to get anything here um, from this other than um, a trial and probably quick death, he commits suicide on the uh, 23rd of that year. Um, Germany officially surrenders um, to, um, or sues for surrender on, on May 7th of 1945, um, and the new chancellor, who is uh, Admiral Karl Donitz, who has taken over, um, he signs the papers of unconditional surrender on May 8th, 1945. This is known in the United States as VE Day, or Victory in Europe Day, and to give you an idea of the importance of it in the American psyche, my aunt, who was literally born on May 8th, 1945, is named Victoria for that reason. Um, what you're looking at, by the way, other than the thing, the parking lot thing, is actually the Nazi memorial to um, the Holocaust in Berlin. It takes up about a full city block. And it's undescript, and it's really interesting. And the idea is this, and the idea is that this is kind of like a prelude to anti-Semitism. And you can see the blocks there, and it starts off fairly simple in Nazism. But then as you get into the depths of the memorial, as you can see on the right, it engulfs you and overtakes all sides of you. Um, and this was put together fairly recently, and I think it's kind of an interesting way to, like, you know, um, look at Berlin or, or see Berlin um, from, like, how modern-day Berlin views, like, Nazism and Nazi Germany. Um, as I would have talked about in class, uh, modern-day Berlin is actually a, a massive um, memorial to all of this. You have to just know what you're looking at, um, just like the stuff on the, on the last slide. And I'll leave you with this last slide, which is the Russian Memorial to Victory right there. The left is fairly obvious. You can see the guy this with the soldier um, saving the women and the child, carrying the crush symbol of the swastika on the um, on the. Um, on the top of the um, kind of pedestal right there. Um, but on the right, you're actually looking at, uh, at um, uh, the parts that flank that statue right there. And it's great because they were actually um, taken from um, Hitler's um, palace. Hitler had had himself um, build, oh God, what would he call it? Like a Fuhrer building or something like that. Basically his, his full full palace in Berlin that he was going to, you know, reside in after the war and stuff like that. And once they bombed this, they had all this red marble they didn't know what to do with. So they took it and used some of it on a tube station nearby and used some of it to build this memorial and stuff like this. Um, and so that's it. May 8th, 1945. Um, Germany signs unconditional um, instruments of surrender. Um, Nazi Germany is completely occupied by all the allies, completely obliterated and crushed, and now it's time to be, re rebuild the world. There's actually an argument in history that says 1945 should just be labeled year zero, because basically the whole world started anew from then.